Good evening. Today is the 15th day of December 2016, and we continue with our series, Explorations in Savitri, with our beloved Alok. Namaskar. I would ask you, as we begin this evening, to invoke Sri Aurobindo's presence amongst us, to guide us, to speak through us with his sweetness and compassion. For no one in the world has ever described the ascension of this stair, world stair, in, in this way. Everything is so clear. And we begin today on page 173, a new canto in the book of the Traveler of the Worlds, book two. Canto six, the kingdoms and godheads of the greater life. As we know, this ascension is undertaken by Asupati, the seer king, as a representative of the human race. If he wanted, he could have gone ahead and completed his individual yoga. We see in book one, canto two, canto three, four, five, experiences of descent, of transformation, of breaking into uh, greater and greater horizons but even as he stands at the gates he is seized by this impulse to bring down the superhuman form on earth and once he is occupied with that he has to now take a longer route this we know in Sri and the mother's life yes. when they stood at this choice whether to complete their individual yoga or carry everyone along one choice was to complete their individual transformation and then get back. And become super mentalized. Yes. Yes. The problem with that was that um, there would have been such a disconnect. As such, there is such a disconnect. Uh, unless you get connected through the deeper heart and there is a grace. Otherwise, when people start approaching from the mind, they feel it's infinity, which is, which is a fact. So had they gone ahead and gone ahead with the individual supramentalization, it would have been very difficult for humanity to connect with them. But at the same time, it is, as you said, most more importantly, it is the compassion of Sri And among the many examples of Sri compassion, this is one of them, to renounce the individual realization, to hasten the collective realization. Very often we think of uh, compassion as, you know, opening hospitals, giving food to the poor. Yeah. Uh, that's philanthropy. Yes. <laughs> Very often an egoistic philanthropy. But Sri compassion, the mother's compassion, is a renunciation of divinity to help struggling humanity to take another step. And in this process we see in book two, now Ashupati making an ascension as a representative of the race. And he is in search of that key which will transform humanity. So he has reached this stair. The plan of this book we know basically there are threefold heavens and abysses. The subtle matter that is the world just behind matter. Then you have the vital worlds or the life worlds to which you have been the devotes so many lines and wonderful pages yes. and then the mind worlds and each of them have their highs and their lows and one could easily mistake any of the highs of any of these worlds as the highest heaven they are so beautiful and they have their abysses also which are like shadows gaping just below the worlds so in this process of ascension we just finished the kingdoms and godheads of the little life now little life is life which has just emerged out of matter 
and has a grip over matter and it is gripped by matter both ways. So in a certain sense it is a grounded life. It knows hunger, it knows uh, thirst, it knows, uh, it knows to reproduce itself. These are the basic qualities of this life, little life. And yet it was a necessary step if consciousness had to wake up. Yeah. Matter had to wake up, it had to start with the crawl of the reptile and the insect. It couldn't have done otherwise. So we read that and its influence upon human nature, uh, all the smallness, the pettiness, the little cares, the, uh, the narrow goals, most human beings living for food and uh, food, family and a small little house belong to this realm of lower life. But within life there is a greater seeking. It is not satisfied. It gets that first thing but wants something more. The urge to expand which is proper to life itself, to grow, to expand, uh, ambition, emotion, sentiments that can you know almost recreate a semblance of heaven here. So all this is also part of life and this is the next step towards which Ashupati ascends. He escapes from that grey anarchy. Yes, that's what we find here. And yet it's a very strange world. Strange world, full of paradoxes. Yes. Almost it is and it is not. Mm -hmm. It can and it cannot. Yeah. Book 2, Canto 6, The Kingdoms and Godheads of the Greater Life. As one who between dim receding walls, towards the far gleam of a tunnel's mouth, Hoping for light, walks now with freer pace and feels approach a breath of wider air. So he escaped from that grey anarchy. This grey anarchy we know is the little world, vital, lower vital, the little life uh, and it's um, full of elemental energies, anarchy. They don't follow any law, it's a chaos out there. This receding walls, uh, yes. I meditated on that for quite some yes, time yeah. because the walls are not coming in on him. Yes. They're coming they out, out and he sees a gleam. That's the other very interesting part. He doesn't yeah. see light, he sees a gleam. A gleam. So, and this gleam also, Shirobindo, look at the perfection of the master poet, hoping for light. Yes. There is a gleam which gives him a feeling that there could be a light. But whether there is a light or not, that we will see as we go by. <laughs> Into an ineffectual world he came. Now look at the adjectives. Ineffectual world. A purposeless region of arrested birth. Where being from non-being fled and dared to live but had no strength long to abide. So it's a world full of hopes of light, but you have only gleams. Yes. Where there is a daring, but not the finding. And a fleeing yes. from, from non-being non to being, yes. but not quite not making finding it. it. Yes. Yeah. So this is the, that's mm -hmm. why Shobindo uses the word ineffectual, mm -hmm. purposeless. And purposeless. And of course, arrested birth. It is as if it was going to reach somewhere, but could not. It was not still born, but born defective. It could do things, but is not capable of it. And why is it so? That he will reveal to us. Above there gleamed a pondering brow of sky, tormented, crossed by wings of doubtful haze, adventuring with a voice of roaming winds, and crying for a direction in the void, like blind souls looking for the selves they lost and wandering through unfamiliar worlds, wings of vague questioning met the query of space. In the lower vital world, one is just satisfied with the smallness. There is no question, there is no query. Here there is a question, but every time one 
tosses the question upward, all that one meets is a doubtful haze. Because above this world is the yes. Yes. whole region of mind. Yeah. And the, the light comes very, very filtered. It's like a very opaque layer over it. Yes. And he uses questioning and then query. Query. In one line. Yes. Wings of vague questioning met the query of space. The questioning of space. Yes. And then again we see the paradox. After denial dawned a dubious hope. Yeah. So in the little mind, there is a denial of light. There is a denial of anything great, anything luminous, anything beautiful. Here there is, ah, there is, and one wants to catch it. But the moment you catch it, it slips below your fingers. This is the sense in this world. Ah, there is sun because I feel it. So you want to catch the sun, light, and you lose it. So, you know, dubious hope. A hope of self and form and leave to live and the birth of that which never yet could be. All the great things that we aspire for and hope that they would be born. There is a hope for that, but it, it never takes place. That he will show us at the end of the canto. And joy of the mind's hazard, the heart's choice, grace of the unknown and hands of sudden surprise, and a touch of sure delight in unsure things. You see, this world has so much influence upon us. Ah, this is it. You know, there are people who come and say that I have experienced delight. <laughs> so, <laughs> mother says to experience just a little delight, you have to be a super Parsifal. So pure within that you, you are not seeking after even a trace of pleasure. And the other day you mentioned about Sri I was just meditating on Sri and I was wondering what a life. I mean, whether it is food or comfort or anything, no seeking for pleasure, nothing. We are surrounded by objects of pleasure. Whether it be television or, you know, food or our environment, the physical life. Nothing absolutely. You know, it was so amazing. Such a, of course, it's one knows it, but it's like a fresh revelation. And all that I could say is, you know, it's impossible for us to touch, forget about reaching that, unless your grace leans down. And yet he had to come down to yeah. us. There was no other way. Just imagine. No. If you look at his life, you know, not a single object of pleasure. And mother says that to have the experience of delight and same is of mother. Yeah. You have to be a super Parsifal with no seeking after pleasure. But in this world, sure delight of unsure things. Yeah. You know, we it's like people who say, ah, mother says it very, very interestingly. He says, at a human level, you cannot find true love. Yet you have to go through these illusions to, you know, arrive at uh, that true touch. She says, but what happens is, in spite of my saying this, in spite of your knowing it, when somebody experiences, he says, no, mine is true love. <laughs> it, it may not be true of others, but mine is true love. Because this world creates that hope, it builds a rainbow and makes you feel that it, it, that's it. <laughs> so, to a strange, uncertain tract, his journey came where consciousness played with unconscious self and birth was an attempt or episode. And so is death in this, you know, kingdom. A charm drew near that could not keep its spell. You see, this is what happens, you know. You are driven by, you know, this world typically one experiences during adolescence, most people. They go through this state when they are driven by a sentimental idealism which colors everything. So the first person they fall in love is the ideal, my soulmate. The first thing they experience in life, ah, I have found it. 
and it's it's a charm which draws them from every side but it could not keep itself so that's what you know a charm drew near but could not keep its spell an eager power that could not find its way a chance that chose a strange arithmetic now mm. this is wonderful what we are going to read is you know it sure window i think i think sure window alone could make a humor out of mathematics or a mathematical humor you see and uh, scientific is, as well yeah <laughs> and uh, so i have an a answer a dream of surreal science yeah a dream of surreal science of science as well but you know here it's hard mathematics yes a chance that chose a strange arithmetic but could not bind with it the forms it made a multitude that could not guard its sum which less than zero grew and more oh, than one i remember long back somebody i was just a witness to a parley between two persons mm. and someone raised this question to the other learned gentleman what does it mean less than zero and more than one <laughs> and they both went rambling into mathematical worlds <laughs> but if you look at it it's a very simple answer you know it's a it's a state of consciousness because these are states of consciousness there are people who who have something let's say a certain certain sum of money let's put it like that you know it's about arithmetic and it grows and grows and grows within you and grows upon you till you feel this is the all powerful more than one and when it crashes you have lost only a small amount you know but you feel that you have lost everything and more than that so less, less than zero less than zero and more than one <laughs> so psychologically because of my psychological background and you know now i see it happening all around in india uh, with that demonetization uh, thing yes. <laughs> overnight people feel that they have become less than zero <laughs> and some others feel they have become greater than one <laughs> so or felt earlier so you know it's a state it that's why it's a strange arithmetic it cannot guard it some the moment you make a form it changes because it's a realm of life it expands you see the moment in this realm you make a person a minister he's not stable he's already eyeing on the king's post so you know it's a form which is ever expanding so before you can hold it it has already grown so it's a very beautiful description arriving at a large and shadowy sense that cared not to define its fleeting drift life labored in a strange and mythic air denuded of her sweet magnificent suns they'll come later it's a mythic air you can call it half real you can call it half untrue here shubhendu is using the word mythic in that sense caring not to define its caring not to define drift. it's just going you know just. when you are in adolescence yeah. and people say you know what is your goal what goal i live i am being you know i am just obeying my heart <laughs> so you see this touch of this life then reason will come then it will temper down everything or the little mind we'll see all this hierarchy in um, in the developmental stages you know in psychology there is a lot of talk about developmental stages but shubhendu is also given the developmental stages here you see the little life which uh, comes in a little baby uh, all that he knows is to eat to drink to evacuate sleep, sleep. sleep. that's the little life and little pleasure you know suckling and that's it then comes this as he grows the touch of a greater life then we will see the little mind the greater mind yes. you know all this come of course most will stop with little mind mm -hmm. that's unfortunate in worlds imagined never yet made true so lot of artists are inspired from these worlds a lingering glimmer on creation's verge 
once strayed and dreamed and never stopped to achieve. That just to dream is enough. It's a joy. Yeah. So we have a gleam, now we have a glimmer. Yes, glimmer. <laughs> and never achieved. So, you know, yeah. one always feels, you know, very often people create a world of their fantasies and they throw it upon the world. But the real world challenges it. And in a way, it does something good to us. Uh, what is called today as reality check. Now, it's not that this is reality. There is a greater reality. But it, it breaks this imperfect formation or an illusory imagining in which we may be trapped. So it does a good service. It's harsh. It's hard. It strikes as a blow. It makes us weep, makes us feel, oh, world is so bad. But actually, it's needed to give us a reality check, lest we be trapped in a world of fantasy and take it for the higher reality. So, the marvel of a twilight wonderland. So it's a twilight space. Full of a beauty, strangely, vainly made, a surge of fanciful realities, dim tokens of a splendor sealed above. So there is a splendor above, but it cannot reach or touch that. Awoke the passion of the eye's desire, compelled belief on the enamored thought, and drew the heart, but led it to no goal. So even in yoga, sometimes, you know, this world may draw one. But the big problem is that unless one foot is steady on the ground and another is as the this Rig Vedic image and the other is ready to climb up to the highest, one can easily either stop here or one can lose hope, get discouraged after the first brush is over and the charm is over. That's why Sri Bunda would insist so much on the real call, the true call. So he drew the heart but led it to no goal. A magic flowed as if of moving scenes that kept a while their fugitive delicacy of sparing lines limed by an abstract art in a rare scanted light with faint dream brush on a silver background of incertitude. What lines? This is now poetry and painting. So it's an actual experience in this world. That's how scenes they will come and pass. Some of them beautiful painting, like a beautiful painting and they just vanish. Dream brush. An infant glow of heavens near to morn, a fire intense conceived, but never lit. Caress the air with ardent hints of day. Here it comes, here it comes, here it comes, here it comes. Yeah. Tomorrow, 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 and one waits for that day which never comes. A fire intense, but never lit. Never lit. Yeah, people in a vital enthusiasm yeah. can do things, yeah. great things. They can take to yoga and show me the caution about it. Intense fire. But it's not the real one. It's an imitative fire of the vital. Right. Now, sometimes the real may be lit. That's a different story altogether. But if this remains, it is not enough to carry us. Yes. It gives an impression. <clears throat> One may be driven by a kind of idealism. Ah, oh, Sri speaks of a new world. Wonderful. You see a lot of new age things coming up, no? Mm -hmm. wow. New world. New world has come. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. So new age mantra, new age. You know, it's just around the corner. I'll just catch it. Transformation. Transformation. <laughs> it's not so simple. You have to be grounded. At the same time, you have to be very persevering, patient. It's a whole journey. So that's what a fire intends. Conceived, but never lit. Carries the air with ardent hints of day. The perfect longing for imperfection's charm. What a wonderful. So, you know, we also have an image of God 
and we have built it with our own same not we i mean you know there are people who are driven by that and they build images of the divine of god of mother mother speaks of that that they don't love me they love their image of me <laughs> so so they build such a certain things yeah. and they build a perfection perfect charm but imperfection charm perfect longing yeah i long i long for this i long for god but what is this god it is a projection of our own human minds fan fancies and wishes yes. so it is imperfect it charms us draws yes. us yes. and we are we feel a longing which is perfect longing <laughs> so if somebody were to say no no divine is not this <laughs> he is far beyond any human thought can conceive or any wish or desire can even hope to reach oh is that so then i think i better go back to my normal life <laughs> and <laughs> look at this line the perfect longing for imperfections charm the illumined caught by the snare of ignorance ethereal creatures drawn by bodies lure to that region of promise beating invisible wings came hungry for the joy of finite life it was not really seeking for the ultimate beatitude yeah its idea of god was something that can make your or the ideal was something that can make your everyday life more comfortable <laughs> so yeah. yeah came hungry crying for finite life you know this reminds me of uh, one of the examples that shri ramakrishna used to give you know here we have that life which is beating invisible wings going to a higher realms but its hunger and cries actually for finite life even though it it's as if it's going to divine for mm-hmm. perfection and uh, shri ramakrishna would say that there are some beings who fly high but their eyes are on the loaf of flesh pound of flesh and so they are searching on the ground for their pound of flesh <laughs> like vultures and even certain eagles of course eagle is a beautiful symbol so we should not distort that symbol eagle is a symbol of the intuitive mind but otherwise you know that they fly high but their eyes are on the pound of flesh and you know it's so unfortunate even in a country like india where we are so supposed to be spiritually so sensitive You have all these baba ji's you know who are talking of god and divine and all kinds of things and waiting for <laughs> what am i going to get at the end of the katha <laughs> so when the whole thing is over and nowadays uh, they say you know i don't know what they will do they will have to install a pos machine because you know you can't give cash earlier they could get cash and <laughs> avoid the income tax now you can't so what if you are a baba <laughs> you have to pay tax you better pay the tax you have to be a law abiding citizen look at shri vindan the mother they always said you know you cannot uh, if you are living in a land you follow the law of the land he used to tell the disciples because they felt some of them we are above the law because you know we are with the divine so <laughs> he said that's true of your inner state when you live in a country you follow the law of the country as simple as that even this he had to write and explain to the disciples can you imagine <laughs> so so we were you know came hungry for the joy of finite life but to divine to tread created soil and shared the fate of perishable things so it was caught in between you know yeah it felt itself too divine <clears throat> so how can it go and you know it's a very image that is very funny one is eyeing on the pound of flesh but well one feels one is too high and too divine and how can one tread on that soil of perishable things <laughs> so one is ever hanging in between <laughs> neither going up nor you know going below so and now there have, comes the word yes the children of the unembodied gleam arisen from a formless thought in the soul and chased by an imperishable desire how can desire not perish because it comes it comes it haunts you it doesn't leave you 
and chased by an imperishable desire, traverse the field of the pursuing gaze. Maybe, yes. When uh, Mary Helen and I first began the wonderful journey of finding definitions for all the special words and terms in Savitri, we worked for many years researching all of Sri Aurobindo's writings and mother's talks and writings. We read Savitri cover to cover about eight times. And finally, the lexicon of an infinite mind was published. The lexicon title is taken from two lines in Savitri. The first lexicon of an infinite mind translating the language of eternal bliss from book 11. So we wrote the lexicon first. And this was all of the definitions <coughs> given by Sri Aurobindo. And for more common terms, we went to the dictionaries and, and added those words. But then there came a time when we couldn't find answers to some of the phrases and extraordinary descriptions. So we, we started on a supplement to the lexicon. And this was a list of all those words that we couldn't find from Sri Aurobindo and Mother. So we went to Nolini, Madhav Pandit, Amal Kiran, <coughs> Alukbai, and Jumodi, who generously gave their time to reply. And I must say that Amal replied almost in his own hand to everything, and I have a huge volume just from him, from his letters. Uh, Alok gave us so much time over these words, as did Jumur. And so I want to read to you the three definitions of this phrase, the children of the unembodied gleam, which we just read. <coughs> Alok, the powers, forces of the vital world that often bear a shining countenance and seek to be embodied here. Amal. The line occurs in a passage describing a region of elusive realities. In this region, everything strives towards form, but never quite achieves it. Evidently, the account alludes to an aspect of the vital world. Lastly, Jumur. They want to enter into a body, these children of the unembodied gleam. As they do not have one as yet, the gleam is light. Sri Aurobindo is speaking of the early light, an infant glow of heavens near to morn. It is the beginning of new light, where all possibilities of manifestation are still just possibilities potentialities, and they are waiting to embody themselves, to manifest themselves as if a new dawn brings in new manifestations. Children, because they are still not quite developed, not fully formed in themselves, it is still just a gleam. So the unembodied gleam. We'll read two lines and then about, we can. About yes, we can, we can. Yes. <clears throat> so we have again that, you know, what we just read, the elusiveness of this world, where everything seems to be real and then it vanishes into as if unreal. Mm -hmm. It cannot stabilize itself, it cannot fix itself, it cannot give form to itself. A will that unpersisting failed worked there. Look at this. Unpersisting yeah. failed. Now it's whether unpersisting is the cause of the failure or whether he's simply describing a will which by its nature it, it is fleeting. It's, it doesn't persist. No. 
and yes it fails yes. life was a search but finding never came you know this canto whole canto also reminded me of a long letter of sri arbindo since you mentioned about the word gleam <clears throat> it's called the valley of the intermediate glimmer and he also uses the word gleam there artificial gleam false glimmer and intermediate gleam and he says that all who take to yoga have to pass through it and while you are passing you enter this zone it's easy enough to mistake this world for the reality it can imitate almost everything of the higher truth but none of them is substantial and so one can be easily trapped there is a whole long letter maybe you know we'll read sometime mm-hmm. because shubhendu again uses the word glimmer which we have just read and he uses the word gleam and beings and forces there how they are tending towards earth and this is the description we find there nothing satisfied but all allured mm-hmm. things seem to be that never wholly are images were seen that looked like living acts looked it has something which almost uh, imitates as if these are real acts you know people for instance uh, let me give an example you know certain gestures that people with this uh, moved by this larger vital can make they can give themselves you know they often say but this giving is very different from the giving which is impelled by the psychic so look like living acts and yet you know they can give away everything this this part of the vital can do it it's a gesture and yet it is not that and symbols hit the sense they claimed to show pale dreams grew real to the dreamer's eyes the souls came there that vainly strive for birth uh, there it is here it comes yes. it is the valley of the intermediate glimmer yes. yes the souls came there that vainly strive for birth and spirits entrapped might wander through all time yet never find the truth by which they live so there there it is so Maybe we, are, we could read that next time. Yes, we could read that next yeah. time, that letter. Yes. And this region is described like all these worlds are described in a different way in Mother's Yoga. So when Mother crosses through this, there loomed a larger head of life. That's how it is described. Right. Similar things. Souls trapped there never can escape. Of course, she qualifies it. It's Shubhendu qualifies it. Why they cannot escape? That's the interesting part. because they believe that they are in a region of truth and light so they don't want to escape you know what may be happening yes. to some of these so called spiritual figures they don't want to because they feel they have found the truth and they found the light so they don't want to escape and say their death walks wearing a robe of deathless life so they are so happy about it so here it is yet never find and spirits entrapped might wander through all time thank god it is might might wander through all time yet never find the truth by which they live they claim to be living you know there are people who say mother is guiding me i am guided by the mother and you know it is such a thing you can't challenge or ask or say but you know it's something very intrinsic no no divine is guiding me but they never find the truth it just that the vital is moving you know someone came to shirbindo and said the para shakti has sent me here para shakti is the supreme mother and shirbindo says very in- inconvenient para shakti she has not told me anything about it <laughs> <laughs> para shakti has sent me here very inconvenient para shakti <laughs> <laughs> similarly we had you know champaklal somebody came to champaklal ji and said divine has sent me here to get some work from you 
So Champaklal ji looked at him, picked up a flower, gave him and told him, go. Go means she didn't say, but the gesture was so strong that you disappear from here, don't stay here. He could see that it is false. But the man didn't, doesn't know. He believes to be it to be true. That is the irony and tragedy of it all. That I was guided by the mother. Divine has guided me. He would even say ki he doesn't know. And then the one who came to Champaklal and bowed before him, ha, and ha. he picked up his by, picked him up by the hair and brought him over to mother. <laughs> yes, it needs too, tremendous sincerity to escape this yes. net. So last four lines. All ran, all ran like hopes that hunt a lurking chance. Nothing was solid, nothing felt complete. You know, that is another reason why they want to take a form and enter matter. Because that's their chance. All was unsafe, miraculous and half true. It seemed a realm of lives that had no base. Look at these lines. All was unsafe, miraculous, miraculous and half true. So at a perfect place we have stopped. This is just a hint of what is going to come.